Welcome everyone to Healthcare 2040, a series that Matter produces in collaboration with Hillrom. I'm Stephen Collins, the CEO of Matter. Matter is a healthcare technology incubator and innovation hub that's built on a belief that collaboration between entrepreneurs and industry leaders is the best way to develop healthcare solutions. Today's program is part of our Healthcare 2040 series, where we look at what healthcare might look like in 20 years and how we're gonna get there. We have a great collaboration with Hillrom to produce this series. Hillrom is a Chicago-based company that has evolved significantly uh, over the last five years with a focus on connected care, uh, earlier diagnosis, workflow management, and other tech-enabled healthcare innovations. It is frankly hard to contemplate what healthcare will look like in 2040 without talking about companies such as Walmart in the same paragraph. Walmart, until very recently, uh, was not a healthcare company. Uh, but then two years ago, uh, Walmart unveiled its first health center and plans for thousands more. They recently acquired a telehealth company and recently announced they will producing, be producing their own insulin brand. Um, and so clearly, they are well on their way to becoming a healthcare company. And we are fortunate to be joined by Marcus Osborne, who's the senior vice president of Walmart Health. In his role, Marcus is responsible for developing and advancing Walmart's goal to provide quality health care that is affordable and accessible. Moderating the conversation today will be Carlos Urea, the global vice president of medical affairs and informatics at Hillrom. He provides medical oversight for evidence generation and dissemination activities and offers guidance in product development and pipeline strategy for Hillrom. We're going to get started with Marcus, who will share a presentation, and then Carlos will join to moderate the conversation. So with that, Marcus, let's get started. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you, Stephen, for having me. And um, um, I'm not so much going to do a presentation as I'm going to share a little bit. I mean, this is, this is talking about healthcare in 20 years. And, and so I'm going to give you some of my views or I call them the theses that I think define what I think healthcare looks like in 20 years. But I didn't actually realize it until uh, you were talking about your introduction that in, in 2040, um, I will turn 65. And so one of the big questions uh, you know, I, I have is, you know, as you look today about how we finance healthcare, uh, will Medicare even be solvent? You know, will there, there and how will I be covered? And what does, what does sort of that reality look like? So, um, and so I, I think this is this is a this is not only an important topic uh, for our our uh, for our sector for our industry for our country. I think, frankly, talking about what healthcare looks like in 2040 is also important for me personally because I'd like to know. Uh, I'm hoping I'm still alive, and I'd like to know what kind of healthcare I will receive. And so, um, what I thought I might highlight is, you know, there's a number of areas I can focus on, but there are there are probably three areas that are three kind of theses that I think for me uh, define what I think, give a glimpse of what I think what healthcare will look like. And I'm I'm going to talk about each and and why I think. Um, why I believe in each of them, um, and certainly these are debatable theses, uh, uh, but but they're ones that I think um, I, I think do define a, a world view. Um, and so I'm going to kind of go through those uh, one by one. And the first one is really, um, you know, there's a lot of conversation around artificial intelligence and the role of AI-driven AI technology and what what's going to happen. Um, I will tell you, I, I, I believe that AI technology is going to play a much bigger role than, than most everybody believes. I believe AI technology will be the front door for healthcare. It won't be providers. Um, th this kind of view of a provider-centered view of the world, I think, will not exist by 2040. It uh, doesn't mean that there won't be a role for providers. but um, And we need to only look at what's, what's happening right now. Um, that first, let's let's talk about the supply problem that we've got from a provider perspective. Uh, they're projecting over the next 10 to 15 years that we'll have a shortfall of anywhere from 20,000 to over 50,000 primary care physicians. We know over the next uh, 10 years, uh, more than 40% of primary care physicians will be over the age of 65. Um, certainly, there may be an opportunity to use advanced practice nurses 
um, and and PAs and other 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 provider types to fill the gap, but not enough. So so certainly we have supply problem, but let's actually focus more on consumers. And what we know today is healthcare is a top concern of Americans, not just because of, because of COVID. It was before COVID. When you ask the question, why are why are American consumers so at you know angst ridden and stressed about the U.S. healthcare system? It's because it's viewed as being wildly unaffordable. I can't I can't afford the care that I need for myself and my family. It's inconvenient and inaccessible. I can't get what I need for myself and my family uh, in the way that I want it. That the system's overly complex, unserving. So you have that sort of dynamic. Um, so that consumers are really frustrated with the way that care is being delivered today. Um, we also have this reality, and I go back on AI and where the technology and innovation is occurring, that, that you know, increasingly these systems are, are leveraging deep analytics of large healthcare data sets um, using unbiased evidence-based uh, approaches to that analysis to determine what are the optimal approaches to care. Um, in other words, you have you have technology, you have systems that are smarter and better equipped to deliver optimal courses of, of care than any one provider can do. Um, and what we know, so so one is that the systems are smarter, um, and two is we know as as humans we're becoming more and more comfortable with AI and AI driven solutions. Um, obviously. You know, you've got Alexa and Google and Siri and others that we're interacting with on a daily basis. But I even think about AI-driven solutions, uh, examples of, say, with the elderly, there are examples of where use of AI-driven solutions and robotics combined uh, to address social isolation um, either delivered the same or better results than human-driven solutions. And we've seen a lot of examples of that. And so... I think what we've got is a situation where, as humans, we're becoming more comfortable with AI, um, that AI-driven solutions are, are becoming, and, and they're becoming more human, they're more understanding, more caring, more empathetic, that AI-driven solutions are fundamentally more scalable, accessible, affordable, and make things simpler for people to engage. And so when you put that all together and you, and you kind of then recognize the supply constraints that we've got on the provider side, um, I, I don't see how AI-driven solutions will become that front door. And so I think that's one kind of big theme. And the real question then is what does that mean? How, how does that then kind of redefine what care delivery looks like? So that's one. Uh, I think another thesis that that I uh, that I think is kind of a critical one is I, I think we're going to see a changing supply chain for care and care delivery and this idea that um, I, you know I get all the components of, of care and of assessment and care occur in one setting I think will not be the future but instead we're going to see this movement of diagnostics and testing and screening pulled out of the care delivery system and moved into a, a much more accessible standalone assessment system. And you know, in some ways, the corollary here, and I'll, I'll talk about how it's sort of applying in the US healthcare system today, but the corollary here, I think, is in some ways what we see in the, in the US auto industry. If you look over the last 20, 30 years, the average automobile in the US is, is on the road longer. And the question is, why are they really being made that differently? No, not really. They have, certainly have more sensors and sensoring. So the sensors enable us to be more intelligent about the health of our vehicle. But we also saw the advent of, uh, and the rise of Jiffy Lube and Valvoline and these kind of uh, uh, preventative maintenance centers that also do these 30, 40, I had one recently give an 80 point check where they're doing deep diagnostics and assessment on your vehicle. And this is not where you go to get care. Mechanics are still where you go to get care. Uh, but these solutions are far more accessible. So between the censoring on your vehicle and, and these much more accessible assessment centers, um, what it's allowed us to do is, is understand the health of our vehicle and have it cared for better. Um, when we actually need deeper levels of care, we go to the mechanic. But now, because of all that, that change in the supply chain, our cars are on the, on the road longer. Um, so why, why wouldn't that be that? Why wouldn't we see the same sort of uh, a solution for, for us as humans. And so I think about what's happened during COVID and you think about what's happened with COVID testing. 
Um, certainly, you saw initially the rise of COVID testing in, in retail settings and in parking lots. Um, you saw the rise of COVID testing through online solutions like Everly Well and Let's Get Checked more recently than you saw COVID testing now over the counter. And it left people asking, you know, why can't I do more this way? Why can't I do flu or strep or other things? Why, why can't I do uh, a chronic illness assessment, you know, cholesterol checks or A1C? Um, we, we actually know that people are interested in their health. Um, at Walmart, um, uh, we have relationships with Pursuant Health and Higgy. And one of the interesting facts is, uh, you know, before COVID, and we suspect this will come back, um, on, on these pursuant kiosks where uh, and Higgy kiosks where people were doing uh, can do biometric testing and health risk assessments. More people were doing assessments on those kiosks in any given week than they were doing in the traditional system. Uh, we had events, these free screening events under uh, the banner of Walmart Wellness Day, where all of our stores for a four hour period on the same day uh, would do these screening events where we would do uh, BMI, and we would do blood pressure, and we do cholesterol, we do glucose or A1C tests. And we would see more than 400,000 people come and get screened in four hours across all our stores. So we know people are actually interested. Um, we, we're seeing the rise of technology that also fills the gap. So 23andMe, Viome, Truvian, the Apple iWatch, I could literally name you 50 to 70 companies that are, are developing innovations that, that change the diagnostic testing uh, screening process. And so we start to put that all together uh, between the technology, the rise of technology, the strong demand and interest uh, from consumers to, to better understand and assess health that, that, that is there, and uh, more exposure to, to different delivery methods that particularly COVID uh, applied. I think this, this new world where we now may be able to kind of go in and, and get kind of our own health assessment, the way we get our vehicles assessed, and then use that knowledge to then go engage with the care providers, have that then guide us to say, when do I need to go to the primary care physician and seek a higher level of care? Or when do I potentially even need to go to a specialist? And so that's a very different kind of delivery method. And so as we think about the future um, and, and think about the technology uh, and how to get applied, I think this is one area certainly that we see uh, changes coming. And then the last that I'll kind of touch on, and, and it applies to, I think both the points above, and, and it really goes back to this kind of concept that we know we're in short supply of primary care physicians, we're in short supply even of APNs and others, that as we think about the future of true care management, particularly around supporting those who are dealing with chronic illness, um, there, there certainly is gonna be a role for people but the question is, who's, who's going to be at the center of that? And so um, I'm, I'm stealing from uh, a woman named Sally Wellborn. Sally used to run benefits for Walmart. And she had this, she would talk about this concept of the rise of the PNP in healthcare, this, this new type of healthcare professional. And the PNP stands for the professionally nice person. Um, and, and really what she was describing was it wasn't so much about this kind of individual who had deep clinical expertise, but an individual who was just good at serving a person, uh, other people. And, um, and so this rise of the role of, of the PNP, and, and we certainly are seeing it already today in healthcare. You think about with uh, home care, uh, the, the emergence of the PCA model or the personal care assistant model. You think about in health insurance and in, and in some care management, the rise of the navigator. Um, you think about the, the increasing role that uh, community health workers uh, play. It, it, um, you know, what we know is that uh, physicians, there aren't as many as we need. They're expensive. They don't scale. They often don't have the time. Um, but the ability to take a reasonably trained person who is, much, who is fully experienced in delivering great customer service and a great customer experience and coupling that with a, a strong with, with technology that is capable of guiding them and directing them. Um, if you think about that combination, um, you can deliver a very robust level of care that's far more scalable, scalable that doesn't demand you having MDs play at every step of the, of the, of the process and then be everywhere in care management. And so, um, and instead, it's about using physicians and providers for those situations that are much more complex where there are really bigger issues. And we've actually seen examples of this, Partners Healthcare um, in Boston, um, uh, also with Harvard, 
uh, had a model that uh, you of doing uh, uh, advanced chronic illness uh, management um, using graduate students. Um, and it was in collaboration, did small tests with uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts that delivered phenomenal results. Where again, it was taking uh, an individual who was oriented to service, but not necessarily you know, deeply clinically capable and coupling that with great technology uh, to deliver a new type of care. And so um, those, are, those are just kind of three areas. Again, I think what they, what they really are about is as you think about uh, being a consumer of healthcare, what it really says is I think we're gonna see a, a, a very significant change in the entire supply chain of how care is delivered. Greater role of AI, the greater role of uh, for you know the PNP, the professional next person, um, uh, uh, kind of much more accessible access to um, assessment and diagnostic solutions that will help us be informed sooner in our health. That that all coupled together, I think, is going to create a very different experience, and I, I fundamentally think a much better experience, one in which uh, we will see uh, much happier, less. Uh, uh, stressed, angst-ridden consumers, I think also we're going to see better outcomes because of it. Um, so uh, with that, maybe Carlos, I know we wanted to uh, get into some discussion. So maybe I'll turn it over to you and, and we'll, we'll, we'll have a little chat. Absolutely. Thank you, Marcus, for your time and your view. Uh, <clears throat> very exciting. I can tell you already that a number of questions have come up and as expected, uh, we knew we we're going to get this, uh, the juices flowing of, of everybody in the audience. So yes, we, we, I have some questions and also, you know, I will uh, include any questions that we get from the audience. So let's start about, you know, the AI and, and we'll talk about these three main topics, but let's focus on AI first. And, you know, what do you think we should be thinking about AR being the front door and how do we, or do we need to incentivize patients to take the initiative? I mean, you mentioned some examples where the patients are already engaged or familiar with the technology. Do you think we need to get to the point where patients need to get incentivized so that they're more accountable for health? And I'll give you, maybe I'll, I'll use an example to get um, one of the questions that came up is, you provided this example of the screening, and then we have people who, what, what do they do with that information? Do they go on follow-up with their physicians? Who owns the follow-up? Who owns the information flow from the screening to the physician or to the primary care setting? Just maybe let's think about that interaction between AI, the patient, and the follow-up with that information? Yeah, I guess what I would say is do we, there's, I think there's a couple of good questions in there. So let me kind of try to touch on all of them. Um, but, but it starts with, I think, a, a better understanding of the consumer, and particularly the American consumer. I think there is a misrepresentation or misconception that Americans aren't interested in, in their health or healthcare. And in fact, that's exact, it's the exact opposite. It, it is the Thing that they're the most concerned about. And that what we'd often say is that the, where often things get attributed as a failure of the American consumer to be engaged in their health, it's actually usually a failure of the system, that the system was sort of designed poorly and that it was, uh, you know, and it, and it kind of it frustrates. And at some point, even when something's really important to you, if you get frustrated enough, you'll just, you'll just go away. Um, and, and so I think the question of incentives um, I'm not. I'm not actually entirely convinced that we necessarily need incentives. What we need is to to find ways to reduce those friction points. And because when you what we find is when you reduce those friction points, people actually engage. Now, to your question, there's another question in there that says, you know, you use the Walmart Wellness Day as an example. So, so somebody comes in, we, and we certainly see this um, all the time, um, where people will come in and they have a screening and something, you know, that they're they've been identified with, you know, they're high blood pressure, uh, hypertensive, they have high cholesterol. Um, maybe they haven't seen a doctor in three years or five years or 10 years, or maybe sometimes ever. Um, what is What we've actually seen, I think there's one point would be um, uh, that we're, we're, not, we're not ostriches. We don't hide our head in the sands. What we, tend, what we have tended to see is people actually take that information and when there is something that needs to be acted on, they actually go and do something about it. They go and say, I just had, you know, they, they, they right. tell us, they, they come back and tell us, I went and saw my doctor or I went and saw a doctor. Um, and so I think what we, we'd say is that that sort of knowledge is empowerment and empowerment sort of drives other action. And so I think that's what we've seen. Now, what I would say is 
as you talk about reducing friction points, this is where us, where, where we as a system can play a bigger role, thinking about in that moment, you've had that screening, you have that information. How can we support you to say, maybe help you do something to say, um, given, given my situation, what's the best path for me? What kind of provider should I go see? Who's the highest value provider? that I should get engaged with? Who's the provider who delivers, them, delivers the most appropriate care at the highest quality? Can you help me immediately schedule an appointment with them? Can you kind of um, support a process where um, it, you, know, you, you follow me through? And so I think there is kind of that support and concierge opportunity as well um, mm -hmm. that could be built out. And that's, that, that actually creates an enormous role for, for technology solutions and innovators to think about how do you actually create that kind of experience? So that's, so I don't know it as much about incentives is I, I actually think what's more important is about us building, investing more and more and better experiences. Um, and, 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 and because when we do that and, and more and more people engage, the more they engage, the more they feel in control, the more they feel in control, the more their health improves. Okay. And Mark, as a follow-up, maybe let's talk a little bit about what AI being the front door to healthcare means. Like I see some people <clears throat> interpret it as, hey, this is that bot that I interact with that is like a non-human person that pretends to be human, right? Uh, or is that the interaction between that, the information that AI provides so that a human then can help out? What's your view or your perspective on this AI being the front door of healthcare? The, the answer is it's all those things and it's, okay. and it's, and it's sort of other things. I think it's, you know, the example of, um, of going back to um, the, the example of, of that, you know, robots that are playing like LEQ and others that are playing roles in terms of engaging with seniors who are home alone. And we want to actually, we want to support people being in their home and aging in place. Um, but we also want to address social isolation they're playing, or they can. It's it's sort of that technology playing a role there. It, it is around kind of bots that are being reactive, where you engage with, you know, you engage with your Google Home device or Siri and have a conversation, or you engage in, a, in an AI-driven text-based interaction where maybe it's reacting to something you're going on. But I also think a lot of it's proactive. Is that increasingly? Um, um, there are, we, we are, are, are committing uh, to, to more and more censoring going on in our home. You look at the, uh, the, you look at the amount of internet of things, solutions between, you know, Nest thermostats and doorbells and, and um, security monitoring and, and, and steering wheels that have biometric censoring in them in your cars and, you know, the, your, okay, you know, you're, your, your phone tracking steps and, um, you know, your, your Apple iWatch tracking, you know, having EKG. Mm -hmm. I mean, these things are becoming more pervasive that there's also kind of a proactive role where the, it is that sort of technology communicating to you um, some things and letting you know what's going on and making recommendations. And then I do think there's the scenario you described where it is then also triggering those who are experts to know when to, to deploy. Um, and, and to know what uh, um, optimal deployment looks like. So knowing when a, uh, a care manager might, uh, somebody who, who, who could provide you care support should reach out to you, um, uh, knowing what they should interact with you around, knowing you know, how your doctor, when you do interact with your doctor, how, they sh how he or she should interact with you. So, so I think it's about all those roles, but I think my point being, your, you, I believe what it means is you will increasingly be turning to technology. You will expect the technology to be your first point of interaction. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it won't be you saying, hey, I'm dealing with a problem. I'm going to call my doctor. It's going to be you saying, I'm going to have right. a conversation with my, with Siri, maybe, or I'm going to have a conversation right. in my home, or I'm going to, um, I'm going to have an interaction, you know, that you're going to do that first. Um, and that will sort of define then the journey that you take thereafter. Perfect. Marcus, there was a question about home care uh, from the audience around, you know, when we talk about these satellites of care, you know, you gave the example of Walmart. Is that, and then you just pull your phone as an example. I'm, I am, I'm assuming that we're thinking, or the way you're thinking about it is that home care is sort of like embedded in the same, you know, care is not necessarily going to be a, 
I need to call my physician for X, right? The care is going to be, I can go to a satellite, I can do stuff at home, I can use that technology to enable that interaction. Is that an fair statement? Yeah, yeah. I, I guess what I would say, the way I would define it is this, and as you think about then the, the delivery system around you, you think about sites of care, you think about um, telehealth, you think about care in the home, physically people coming, then coming into your home when you need care. Um, I, 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 you know, what I sort of will tell, what I, what I would say is, I think it's important to think about those not as kind of independent competing channels, but, but think about that in a world that is increasingly omni-channel. And omni-channel is about where all those channels start to actually integrate and, and you get an experience that no one channel by itself could produce. Um, and, and so this idea that they, that they, because of the ability uh, to link them with data and information and analytics and insights, they all kind of morph. So it's, you know, based on what you need in that moment, what you want in that moment, but they're all kind of optimized with one another to, to kind of create this kind of more, this better experience for you. And so, um, yeah, so I think there, it's, it's, I think that's, in fact, that's what we're really already seeing. I mean, the, the fundamental facts are, and we, with the growth in telehealth that's occurred in COVID, uh, telehealth often can't, you know, telehealth experience can't close a lot of the clinical interactions. You have to still then have a, have a physical engagement. You know, you may have to have a test run or you may have to, you know, you may have to have some biometric run. Um, there are some instances in which, um, you know, you're seeing people saying, yeah, I'm comfortable getting care in the home, but there are times in which I don't want to get care in the home. I don't like people coming to my home. I want to go out in the community and get it. And if our goal is to enable people to get it, we want them to engage, we shouldn't sort of dictate how they get it. And so I think this omni-channel environment is the one that actually defines the type of experience we'll come to expect and the mm -hmm. type of experience that we're gonna get. Okay, perfect. Marcus, I'm gonna ask a series of questions now related. I mean, a lot of our audience here today is people who are designing or thinking about yes. designing or really embedded in that world. Yep. So let's, let's try to get to some of those you know, recommendations. I see some questions for it. Um, let's start with you know, generic. Let's start with unmet needs. As you think about today or maybe 2040, which is the intent, what are sort of the unmet needs that on this view of the non-physician-centered you know, care or this AI as the front door of care, what do you feel are the unmet needs sort of like a broad level out there that, that the healthcare industry will benefit from? Well, I, I think I sort of characterize them, um, I, I characterize them in a, in, a, in a couple ways. One is what are the unmet needs of the consumer or the patient? Um, and I, I, I think the, un, I mean, we sort of describe them around those kind of angst points, which are, mm -hmm. are I, I know that I need care. I, I want I want to actually have more control over my health. I want to be, I, but but that when I sort of go out today, the 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 system is letting me down. I, I either I, I can't afford it, and so I'm even afraid to go out and get care because I don't even want to know how much I'm going to pay after the fact for it. Um, that when I do try to go out and get it, I, I'm sort of I'm maybe run through hoops, and and you know and and I'm and I'm. And so there's this kind of convenience and accessibility challenge and, um, and uh, it is an issue. And then I think about, um, and, and I'll, I'll give you an example. And then the last I think about, we talk about complexity that people, you know, we, we, there's, there's actually a perception that, that, that the system is intentionally designed to be complex to overwhelm us as consumers. I mean, that, that's, a, that's a scary thing. I mean, if you think those of us who work in healthcare, what, supposedly we're out there trying to help people but there's a belief for those of, amongst those who consume that it was actually designed to make it really hard for us to get what we want. Yeah. And, and I'm sort of mindful of this situation. This is, this, we could probably all, this is one you see a lot and there's been, we've seen it played out a lot of, take somebody who's dealing with some musculoskeletal issue that they've had some ongoing knee pain. Um, that uh, often what you kind of hear is, I'm afraid to actually go in to the doctor about it because I'm gonna get one of, Here's what's going to happen. They're, first, they're going to lecture me. They're going to tell me it's about, it's my fault because I'm overweight and I need to exercise more. But when I exercise, it hurts. Or they're going to tell me I need to eat healthier. Or I've tried and um, 
So I'm going to get lectured. And then secondarily, they're almost certainly going to push me to a specialist. I'm going to go to an orthopedist, and that, which means that I'm probably within six months going to get operated on. And operations cost a lot of money and those kind of things. Except here's what we actually know on the back end. When we look at the data of that of people, for example, who've gotten knee replacements or hip replacements or spinal fusions in the last year, more than half, or excuse me, in the last five years or 10 years, it doesn't really matter the time frame. more than half of them, those were unnecessary or inappropriate. So we actually are got, so, so people are actually right. They're, they, they feel like they're being steered down a complex path that they maybe don't need. And that's, in fact, the, the truth more times than not, that maybe physical therapy or yoga would have worked, that they could have tried other sort of alternative options. Um, and so I think that, you know, the, what we're trying, the knee state or what we're trying to address with consumers is creating an experience that enables them to address these point of angst so that they feel like they can engage more and in engaging more, they get their underlying needs addressed. Um, I also think there's some others that, that are important of, and I'm not, I don't want to certainly, I think it's important to think about the providers of care, providers of care, and particularly now with COVID are burned out. This is a hard system to work in, and so uh, I, I think they want to be valued, and they want to. They, you know, if you're a physician, you want to you want to do things that you want to work to the upper third of your licensure. You don't want to spend all your time on administrative tasks. Um, you want to be providing care, and you want to be providing care that, to those people who need it the most. Right. And so I think increasingly, as well as we think about this kind of AI-driven environments, it, it's one in, that is actually about enabling physicians and nurse practitioners and dentists and optometrists and to 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 actually do more uh, uh, do more around what they're actually interested in you know provide higher level care don't worry about the like paperwork but but just provide care that's that's really necessary and so so I think it's I think as I think about this environment it's about actually solving for a number of challenges certainly and primarily for consumer challenges but also I think there's an opportunity for us to solve for the, the challenges that providers of care are, are yeah. facing. <clears throat> Marcus, there's so much to unravel in your comments and like the questions just keep coming up. So, <laughs> uh, I'm trying to manage the flow so we don't I, get I lost. I can't figure I, how many people yeah. say, are saying this guy's crazy. I, I'm so trying to be uh, inclusive. No, they're all good. So maybe let's finish up with the, you know, as I think about, you know, the audience and, you know, empathy has come out a couple of times. So people talk, talk about dehumanizing. So people talk about empathy. So like, you know, technology, interaction, empathy, the human touch. I think you've given a few examples as to why do you think there is not a concern? You know, we talk about the professionally nice person, which is a whole topic of discussion, which we love as well. And we'll, we'll touch on that. Sure. Um, do you see any concerns when we look about the technology set, maybe looking very narrowly, at the interaction, the, the, the challenges or the potential challenges with implicit bias and things like that. Where, where, what's, what's your mind and, and what will be the recommendations for the people that are looking at these technologies to develop? Well, I, I guess the way I would say, I think you, you actually make a good point. I guess what I would say is this, that um, a technology-driven or technology-centered approach doesn't necessarily imply that it's a not non-empathetic one, and I think the fundamental issue that I see, and it, it doesn't it doesn't actually matter whether it's a technology-driven approach or a, a human-driven provider-driven approach. Those solutions that create an environment for us as humans that is in fact empathetic were those that I think used a, a very specific design approach. And so my challenge to the innovators and those of you who are building solutions is to think to, to is to what is the design approach that you're committing to? And what I'll tell you, and I've talked about this a lot and it sounds very academic, but, uh, and I'll kind of share it here. I, I, what I would tell you is the typical design approach in healthcare um, is what I've always called the balanced interest paradigm. And it goes something like this that if you want to design something really great in healthcare, you have to balance the interests of all the key constituents in healthcare. So, so not just the patient, but the providers, the payers, and even the product manufacturers, pharma and device manufacturers and like. And if you, if you address all their interests, if you address the interests not just of, of, of you know, me, the patient, but you address the interest of Blue Cross Blue Shield or United, you address the interest of 
you know, uh, of, of Kaiser Permanente or you address the interest of, you know, tenant hospitals or mercy hospitals or of the local provider group, you address the interests of Pfizer and Medtronic, um, then, then you're gonna be successful. What I'll tell you is that leads to, that, that is our problem. That is the right. wrong design approach. The right design approach is a really simple one. And, and I'll, 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 give this, I'll tell people this is the secret. There's only one group that matters and it's the consumer, so design for them. And try as much as you can for as long as you can to ignore the rest of those constituents. At some point, I know they'll come in. At some point, you're going to have to ask the question, well, how do I get paid to do this? Or at some point, you're going to have to say, like, oh, okay, I'm going to have to apply this in a provider environment. I have to think how I connect with health systems. At some point, you're going to have to think about how this connects into the therapeutics guys. Or maybe you're going to want pharma money to help fund what you're doing. And that's, that's, I'm not saying they're not important. But I think if, if you just start with a consumer kind of only approach to design solutions, um, those are the ones that, that naturally, then, then empathy is front and center. What I'll also tell you is that this is my, this is my assessment. And people can debate me, but actually I haven't been proven wrong once yet in 15 years. And so that, so this is, I'm wrong all the time on a lot of things. <laughs> this is the one thing that I have never been wrong on, which is when people show me successful solutions, the ones that really work, that by the way, the ones that benefited providers and the ones that benefited payers and the irony is those are ones that were consumer only design. In other words, the, the great irony is often the consumer only design approach ends up being of benefit to all those other groups, even though they may not have been central to the design process. And so I don't, that, that would be my challenge is stay as focused on people as long as you can and don't, don't, allow, don't allow the gravity of those other groups to kind of pull you until you absolutely have to. Yeah, <clears throat> Marcus, I think that's very true. I will say that I, I, I will support that approach. I, you know, lots of conversation on that topic. I, I can tell you there is some, you know, as people think about design, there, there's a lot of questions about uh, reimbursement. You know, what if I do this? You know, how am I going to get people to get reimbursed? There are like regulatory hurdles. And does it really, you know, how do you address that? And to your point is, if people want it, those barriers, you know, and people will accommodate to that. Yeah, um, and, and maybe just real quick on that. I mean, I think, yeah. you know, I don't want to ignore the reimbursement realities. And, and but what I would say is, and there's a lot of conversation, I mean, there's a lot of discussion and good discussion happening and, and a lot happening around this kind of movement from fee-for-service to fee-for-value. And, and you think about the kind of rise of value-based care and the rise of value-based reimbursement. So I think certainly that environment of, of people thinking more creatively about how we pay th for things systemically. The other thing that I wouldn't miss is the rise of the, I mean, you are seeing some growth, not, not, you know, uh, of the rise of the consumer saying, you know what, at a certain point, like I'm, I'm willing to pay for it too. Um, and, and you, you look at groups like, I mean, you look at the success that groups like Noom have had recently. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it shows that people will consume. I will pay personally for, for, uh, uh you look at, People kind of signing up to one medical and 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 um, uh, and or if I'm caring for an aging parent, the willingness that people have to say I'm willing to pay for my parent. You know, it's not about what my insurance is paying and whether that's under a value based range mm -hmm. or not. So I, so I, what I will tell you is there's actually a lot of innovation occurring on the payment side right now, not just around the kind of fee for service to fee for value, but I'd also say what are consumers willing to do and not do and spend money on and not spend money on? And so I think that creates, it's not like, I'm not saying it's not hard, but it right. creates more avenues to think about your business model than you had 20 years ago when consumers weren't really paying for anything and it was all fee for service. Yeah, and I can see some of the questions here are what I call the anxiety bucket, which are very appropriate. This is not disrespect to the questions, but yeah. you know, hey, are we going to have a problem like the way we had with EMR? They told us EMR was going to be the greatest thing ever. And now we're like, just, you know, we don't know what to do with all the information. What about liability? Now you're telling me that somebody somewhere knows that, that some lab test is abnormal, but that information didn't make it to another place. Is the app liable? Is the physician that should have known liable? Um, and and so, so I think there is, you know, there is that an, a true anxiety based on the experiences that we have so far about Am I going to have now a bunch of information that is not going to be actionable? But I think your point is, listen, if you keep thinking about designing for the end user being that patient, 
then all of those things will get addressed as opposed to trying to design for for the whole world where those that's right. you know, trade-offs are like coming to place and you end up with nothing correct yeah and so let me let me actually use this real yeah. quick because i think you, that's your spot on let me use the emr as an example the emr was an example of a of a, of a of not to knock all these groups and sort of put them all under one bucket but what i would say is if you look at the emr solutions that exist today and what i think we would say mm -hmm. is the 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 bold promise that was put out there 10 20 years ago maybe hasn't fully come to fruition the next question why and i go back to that design reality i i will say this and this will probably get me in trouble but i'll say it anyway uh, as i look at emr solutions broadly as i look at the entire sector it still feels to me like most of what they've done and most of the design work has been around how you do clinical data capture so that i can get paid it wasn't necessarily about creating an experience in which you were using information and, and engaging real time to deliver a, a superior, higher quality clinical experience that helped improve the health of the consumer. Now, don't get me wrong, I think they're all trying, but a lot of those systems were designed for payment. Mm -hmm. that, I mean, and that's what I like to say that that would be like me using, I don't know, like the, the point of sale system uh, for, you know, to, to, to do, you know, the, you know, credit card capture for Visa right. MasterCard to, you know, to, to, to provide great financial services. Now, and I'm like, does that make any sense? Like if I was trying to improve your financial literacy, that, that's not the way to do it. I mean, it's, it's, it seems kind of foolish. So, so I think that's the problem is if, if we wanted those systems, if we do want systems that are fundamentally going to, going to transform care for people and deliver higher quality care and deliver non-variant care, based on evidence-based approaches, I think we do have to rethink, I, I do think we have to rethink the EMRs, uh, I, I do. Yeah, and, and I think and, and I think to just, you know, bring it back to everybody, remember that, you know, Marcus is not only talking about AI as the only solution, you know, there is a concept of the AI, the supply chain, and the people, right? Like, I mean, there's yeah. like this interaction that has to work. Um, something that has, keeps coming up and i think it goes back to your earlier statement about hey will medicare be able to take care of for us right like take care of us i mean it's getting yeah. very expensive cost and transparency and lots of questions lots about hey a lot of the deal the problems we're with and you know we talk about the empowered consumer how can we empower a consumer when they don't have great visibility about you know what the implications of the decisions are somebody share an example how they got a test in one state and they crossed the border <clears throat> two miles and it was like 40% cheaper. Where do you see these sort of, let's talk about this care setting or supply chain, AI people and the cost of care. And where do you see that future is gonna be at in 20 years from now? Yeah, I, here, here's what I'd say. I think, I, I, think, um, I think transparency is, is critical and um, I would say that some of it is around where you're saying around cost. Um, and I think it's a big piece. I would also say that cost isn't enough. I, I, I think the, I think it is about um, how do we actually help an individual in, in, in whatever moment they're in whatever kind of health situation they're dealing with, understand their options and understand who or what represents the best method or best approach for them to get what they need um, so that they get the best outcome at the lowest price. And so um, I, I think it, I will tell you the one thing that's kind of in healthcare that I it, it is uh, price matters, but I'd also say healthcare is the one, it was probably one example was you have to go beyond price. And, and so I, I think about two other factors being critical. We talk a lot about quality. I want to be very clear when I use the word quality, what do I mean? Quality means to me, when you do something, do you do it well? Um, you know, when you do, you know, when you, when you kind of, uh, uh, do, you, do you, if you do a procedure on me, am I less likely to be readmitted down in the next week, month, three months? Um, do I, are you, am I more likely to get the, 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 the best, most positive outcome? So that quality matters. Appropriateness matters just as much. Mm -hmm. Appropriateness means, should you even be doing what you're doing? Yeah. Um, and so I think when you put cost, 
uh, transparency and clarity around cost, uh, transparency around quality, transparency around appropriateness, and you actually create a, a new approach that assesses provide individual providers and professionals based on that sort of combination of metrics. And you start to then tie that back to me as an individual and say, in the moment, I'm going to take whatever you're dealing with and help you kind of figure out what is the best path. Um, that I think is what what ultimately matters because that's what in, ends up getting us mm -hmm. to to total total lowest total cost, meaning mm -hmm. better health at a, at the lowest total cost for consumers. So so I think we've got a ways to go. I think you're seeing a lot occurring on the on the transparency side around all those kind of factors. Certainly, we've seen it with. You know, early on with groups like Castlight and others around price transparency, you've seen the kind of rise of, of um, Amino and Grand Rounds and in Bold Health around quality and, and appropriateness. Um, I, think, I think we're going to continue to see iteration around that. My hope is what we're going to get to is an environment where there is just deep transparency that consumers will kind of have that based on what's going on, the, the system will be able to guide them. Providers will do smarter referral, and you know that that that. Um, um, but that we're going to hold everybody in the system accountable um, to to a much more uh, to to kind of a to a better standard. Okay, Marcus says as I start, you know, sort of like taking trying to wind down, so we sure. we're able to stay to our one hour commitment. And and I again, I uh, lots of good questions, lots of comments, and I will not be able to to move them all forward let's talk about let's go back to walmart a little bit and yep. and you know let's think about or, or what can you share with us about what walmart is thinking of to become like this sort of a stable of care like a staple of care right you guys are fairly new in the space but you know with lots of noise appropriately so um where, where do you think walmart is going to go and 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 what what's the vision for the company yeah, I mean, in some ways, we, you know, some of the things we've done sort of are newer. I think some of the things are, are not. I mean, I think our legacy, um, in many ways, you know, we we've been in the we've been in in in, in a lot of kind of healthcare related businesses for a number of years. You you know, third largest pharmacy in the U.S. We've been in the pharmacy business for decades, um, and you know, but I I think we go back. It, it was it's it was almost uh, or it was 15 years ago that. You know, we the, we they had a team at Walmart who had this kind of small idea of saying, "Hey, what if we could figure out how to make drugs more affordable and 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 transparent on the price? Let, let's figure out how we can go take not just one or two, but hundreds of meds in every major therapeutic category, and let's just set them at a clear price and tell people that's what their price is, regardless of whether you are covered by insurance or not, and regardless of the quality of your insurance." And so that was the advent of the four dollar generic program, and what was one thing that we learned from that, what was really interesting was when we launched that program, what what happened was the get, you know, certainly we benefited from it. We saw gains in customer traffic, but a lot of those customers were people who were not filling prescriptions. It wasn't so much that they were coming from competitive pharm pharmacies, but they were people who had prescriptions in their pocketbooks or the dashes that are trucks that they just weren't getting them filled because they didn't know they could afford them. And now they could. Or uh, they were coming in more often. They weren't doing pill splitting. And we saw, saw a lot of that where you'd have a, a 70 year old couple who was splitting pills because they couldn't afford each to have their own set of meds and now they could. And, and that, that still continues to sort of drive what we're doing. And so I, I'd say, um, you know, it was mentioned kind of earlier some of the things on, you know, the recent launch of the fast acting insulin uh, solution uh, under, uh, under, uh, 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 for us as a, as a kind of private brand uh, under rely on um, is sort of an example of that desire. How do we make the things that people need more affordable so that in health so they can get them? But I, I think the other thing, and we talked a little bit about, you know, the launch of Walmart Health, which are these large scale integrated health centers that have full primary care and lab and imaging and behavioral health and in some locations, physical therapy and social health services and ancillary services like dental and vision and hearing. And there's other services that are in there, but um, all kind of integrated. The acquisition of MeMD, which is a telehealth platform um, that we're going to leverage. Um, uh, the, and there's a number of other kind of things we're doing in the home and, and exploration of digital health. Um, 
that really goes to our desire again to say how can we uh, can we, you know, how can we put forward our own version of this kind of omni-channel solution for health for people? Can we address, can we make care more affordable? Can we make it more accessible? Can we make it simpler? Um, and so that's, that's really it. I mean, it's, it's, it, in my mind, it is, it is just the, it is the um, logical, but, and, and depending on who you ask, the very long journey uh, for us. Uh, going far back as as um, the four dollar generic program, but I, I think in some ways it even probably goes back to when Walmart decided to enter into the broader food business, and people were like, "It's crazy! You're going to have this thing called the Super Center where you're going to sell T-shirts and bikes and hammers in the same place that you're selling bananas and you know produce and you know dairy and those kind of things." And we did it, and in many communities, we helped. We made food more affordable and we actually brought produce to communities that often didn't have access to it, right. to, to fresh, other than maybe what they could grow for themselves. Um, and so I think it's part of that journey of, you know, if you improve access, if you make things affordable, if you make things simpler, people engage when they engage, guess what? You, our lives get better. And so that's that's the big bet. And so that's what, you know, that's why we're in the care delivery side now more and more and why we'll do more. Uh, and there's certainly more to come. Um, but yeah, so I, I think it's just it's just part of this kind of ongoing mission that we have and, and this belief that if we can play a role in the communities where we exist, um, we believe we can have a big impact on the health of, of the people we serve. Awesome. Thank you, Marcus. Uh, you know, I want to thank you. And I, I maybe I have a, one more question before I turn on, I, I turn it over to Steve for closure. And it's really related as we think about our healthcare 2040 series, we're thinking about, you know, what's going to happen in, in 20 years from now. And part of the technology we're talking about, you know, next uh, week for those on the, on the call, we're actually going to talk about voice and the role of voice. And, and I think you mentioned it, you put up your phone. Am I going to have a conversation with Siri, with Alexa, you know, whatever, you know, technologies there available. What, what do you see? in terms of trends and you think voice is something that um, we're going to see more of here to stay a fad where where do you put voice and what's your view on the voice or the future yeah no i what i would say is i i, I absolutely i i think um you know i, I view it as um a, a way in which you know you're just seeing great engagement there and people and people becoming more and more comfortable uh, engaging through voice enable solutions um you know I'd, I'd, I'd be remiss to say I, I i would more strongly encourage you to use google home or or uh or siri uh but uh um but the uh but in reality i think we're gonna yeah we believe you're gonna see more and more of it and the reality is those technologies are becoming better and better every day and mm -hmm. and so um i believe there's an enormous enormous role i think you're going to see them i mean we're already seeing it embedded in more and more products in your vehicles and I, you know, I was uh, uh, in obviously in your phone and some of your smart devices in your home. I saw a version that was embedded within a, a, a soon to be, or maybe maybe not soon to be, but in a in a future kind of coffee maker. You're seeing yeah. them in your refrigerators. You're seeing them kind of pervasively. You're seeing them in schools. Um, uh, and so I, 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 yeah, I think there's an enormous role there um, because I think it's the the more we are comfortable with that as a venue for interaction, the more that we're going to be willing to kind of try it for other things, including um, supporting our health. Perfect. Yep. Thank you, Marcus. And for those interested, uh, we'll, we'll be talking about it uh, next week. So Marcus, once again, I want to thank you very much. Uh, on behalf of Hillbrook, great conversation, lots and lots of questions. I'm starting to see some thank you comments uh, for your thoughts, your uh, honest input. So we really appreciate it. And I'm gonna turn it over to Steve so he can uh, wrap this up. Thank you all. Thanks so much, uh, Carlos. And thank you so much, uh, Marcus, um, for sharing your perspectives. It was a really engaging and thought-provoking conversation. And clearly uh, the audience felt the same way. There were something like 70 questions plus a lot of comments uh, flowing in the chat. So apologies that, um, you know, Carlos and Marcus weren't able to get to all of your uh, of your questions, uh, but thanks so much for um, to both of you for uh, such a great conversation. And thanks to everyone for uh, joining us. If you enjoyed uh, today's conversation, I hope you'll join us for part two, which Carlos mentioned uh, next week, where we'll have uh, Amazon's Alexa Health and Wellness uh, lead to uh, discuss voices role in the 
evolution of care deliveries model delivery models. Um, you can register on our website. It's matter.health/events. Thanks again to all of you for joining us. We'll see you next time.